The institutions are starting to crumble, but nobody really cares. Then the fourth turning, the last part of the cycle, which we're in now, started around 08, is essentially the period where our institutions suck. We don't trust them, but we realize that we need them. That's that demand for order rising, rising, rising. And so how Bitcoin fits in here is historically, the seeking order comes from either flirting with communism, flirting with fascism, and being willing to go to total war to save yourself. That type of energy comes in. We got to make a major change because society is going off the rails. What we need to resolve the fourth turning is a source of stability, a source of order. Usually that's post-war. We reset the pieces. Nobody wants to fight. We have new institutions. I think Bitcoin plays that role in at least in some extent as a new institution because as we, we mentioned prior, no state is involved. This is a social technology. This is a public good, just like the internet. And it allows us to individually save our wealth, which helps us not want to fight as a country, as a state, as a business. We can start moving ourselves over to this new Bitcoin thing rather than crumble with the old system. All right, Brandon, quit and welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, man, me too. I think uh, what I love about Bitcoin is that when you follow people online and you read what they wrote, you know, which is basically, you know, a little, little um, insight into their thoughts. Um, there's a lot of connection already. And I think you touch topics that, uh, that I'm also personally very interested in. So I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to, to chat today. And uh, yeah, I, I wanted to start because what I really liked is that uh, I think we are both on this Bitcoin path, you a bit longer than me, but I saw you were on a corporate path in tech before, but you weren't happy and you eventually changed your entire path also together with your family. And I wanted to start with asking, um, yeah, could you share a bit about this experience and your thought process also eventually ending up in, uh, in Bitcoin? Absolutely. And if I can, I'd love to touch on the writing side uh, quickly. So I think online, the world is big and there's a lot of people and a lot of communities. How do you, how do you find the right people? How do you find friends? How do you find partners? How do you find jobs, etc.? And I think writing online is a, a secret way to um, create inbound opportunities for yourself. And yeah, to your point, you really get to know someone if they share their unfiltered thoughts and some writing. And so for me personally, publish, I've been publishing online since 2013. Probably if I add up all the views, like three or four million or something, previous blogs that I don't, that I don't even have up right yeah. now. Nice. Um, but the point is, you create something, especially in Bitcoin, and all of a sudden you have inbound. And I wrote some stuff about mycology, and now I have an army of people online sending me all the latest mycology science. Many of these people have become my friend. Yeah, I love I've that. gotten jobs, uh, advisor shares in, in companies, uh, simply from creating content. And then that starts the conversation. So if anyone's considering it, that's just my quick plug for writing online. Um, okay, so corporate path to today. Yeah, so I grew up in Minnesota in the United States. I was a student athlete in high school, but what really stood out for me was I created like a hundred little businesses as a kid. I was washing cars and bikes. I I built I dug a pond, I raised fish, tried to sell them. <laughs> it didn't work. Um I was like stealing my parents' beer and wine and selling it door to door to my neighbors when I was like six <laughs> years old. Um uh, then this, you know, I got in trouble there. I was like, does your dad know you're selling their beer for below what the liquor store will sell it for? <laughs> uh, you know, I learned my first lesson in having to buy my own inventory led into, led to a whole soda pop empire where I hired all the neighborhood kids, walkie talkies, coolers and wagons. We'd bike around selling pop to the construction workers and where they would be like building a whole neighborhood of new houses. And so anyways, I have that sort of commercial mindset from, from an early stage and always trying to solve problems and creating little businesses. Um, I started my career though, after school, after university it, at Oracle selling enterprise software. So pretty typical, big corporate sales job, long sales cycles, uh, very large dollar amounts. And I thought this was the job for me. My whole life was leading to this moment. I was the youngest person hired to the role, went really well, made lots of money, recognized promotion, blah, blah, blah. And on the outside, people would say, wow, it looks like everything's so good. And it did feel good for a little while. 
And maybe after three years or so, I started to realize that the, the sheen wore off. Now it's like, this is the rest of my life. I already sort of figured out the game. I just iterate here for 5% growth annually for the rest of my life. And I get very bored very easily. There's no way I could pull that off. And so I was being groomed for a promotion and met out, went out to meet with the new team. And honestly, the people that the team I was about to join, I witnessed them in their natural environment. Let's say we had an offsite and most of the people were deeply sad, unhappy, rude to servers, brag about infidelity and alcoholism. And I just sort of like saw a flash before my eyes and I go, this is the path I'm on. If I continue mm -hmm. here, this is who I'll become. And so somehow a, a stroke of maturity at a very young age, I said, pause. I went back and, and many other reasons to assume I was not very mature at that age, but table that. Um, I went back to Minneapolis. I hit pause on, on that career path and I went through a yoga teacher training. And mm -hmm. this was a, a side passion of mine for quite a while. And yeah, I went through that to study, to learn. And now I sort of had a forked life direction in front of me. I had the, the sales path and I have this like esoteric, weird health, yoga, spirituality path. And benefits of both for sure. But during that experience, it sort of gave me the confidence to say, hey, you know what? You don't have to go down this corporate path that the external world is telling you. You should go down, even though deep down inside you're, you know, it's not the right thing at the time. And so I also started experimenting with psychedelics around the same time period. I, uh, right in the middle of yoga teacher training, totally clean, practicing yoga all the time, eating well, sleeping well, blah, blah. Uh, I smoked some DMT, dimethyltryptamine. In that experience, which is a very, very strong psychedelic, it lasts like 15 minutes. Uh, yeah. You can't believe what you see, what you experience for, for anyone uninitiated. And through that experience, I essentially got the message like, Hey, you should go, you should go, uh, explore. You should, you should say bye bye to corporate America for now. Um, uh, it was way crazier than that, but that's probably enough for this, <laughs> this venue. Yeah. And about six months later, my girlfriend at the time, now wife and mother of my kids, um, we sold everything we owned, bought a one way ticket to India and started traveling and working online. And we did that for about five years before finding Bitcoin. And it was a pretty classic story. I read the four hour work week. I started looking up online businesses. I started meeting people doing it, make a blog. Uh, it's funny looking back now, but maybe a year into that, we were earning more money than we were spending traveling around Asia, working at digital nomad hubs. And we're like, we we discovered the secret of the universe. You just hit the computer at some weird beach, money comes out, we're going to travel forever. And unsurprisingly, that path sort of wore off. You know, I, I got a little bit jaded. There's no way I could go to another temple, another waterfall. I was so sick of laminated menus at the backpacker ghettos around the world. I wanted a garden. <laughs> um just like rebel against that. So the pendulum mm -hmm. swing all the way to hippie land. Then it, then uh, I found Bitcoin. So from like corporate sales douche to like traveling yogi, nomadic, whatever, found Bitcoin 2017. Um, friends just trading shit coins, making money like, Hey dude, this is easy money. So I started trading all the shit coins in 2017, made a bunch of money. Uh, 2018 lost a bunch of money. Uh, <laughs> okay. Shit. What am I doing here? And honestly, the first thing that lured me in was, well, making money was number one, which I think is true for pretty much everyone, if they're honest. Yeah. Uh, the next step was mostly Ethereum narrative, honestly, which was like decentralize everything. Um, I sort of fit my political back then, right? ambitions back then. Back then. The in 2017. Back then. Yeah, exactly. Yes. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. 5.2 narratives prior. Yes. Uh, that lured me in. And then after I lost a bunch of money in 2018, I was living in Chiang Mai, Thailand, talking to crypto Bitcoin people all the time. And I sort of realized that that whole stuff is silly and that Bitcoin's the thing here. And then I went through like a crazy person, you know, 16 hours a day, reading books, study and do this, do that. And I, I pretty much just put our online businesses on autopilot, outsourced myself out of the business, barely did anything. Um, and had about a six month study period 
figured out what I need to figure out. Okay, I'm changing careers. This is the path. Mm -hmm. And did all kinds of odd jobs. I had a consulting firm. I built some small, like micro niche products. None of them were very successful. Um, and then I met Corey Clipston, the CEO of Swan at the Bitcoin conference in San Francisco in 2019. It was maybe only like 2,000, 3,000 people. Um, looking back, very pivotal moment. Met Corey there. We had a good chat. And soon after that, in 20, end of 2019, I joined Swan. And I've been there since. Um, came up through the marketing org. Um, now I oversee the client facing teams. And yeah, I was employee four. It's been a wild ride. And it feels very, very good to be on the Bitcoin mission mm. with a bunch of other crazy Bitcoin people building something together. Um, it's been by far the most fun, most rewarding work type experience I've ever had. And, um, yeah, that, that's bringing us up to present day. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app, or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Fun to hear, man. I uh, I have a similar path, I think. Um, not working in Bitcoin yet, but I think going from... I'd say you also sound very like uh, uh, interested in tech, business, right? Like trying to be at the forefront of like, what is new, trying that out, right? To see like, what are people working on? Is this something I should pay attention to, right? And um, I... I think also like I've been in Bitcoin since 2014 and on off, right? But actually when I found Ethereum, I don't know, like very early $7 or, or something, $70, or $70. Like also that that entire narrative drove me, drove me back in. And I also had to go through that phase of, I don't know how many new neo banks I funded in their ICO that don't exist, right? Like just going through all that stuff to eventually get to that point. Um, where I realized, no, Bitcoin is the only thing to pay attention to because it's also a totally different thing than all these, you know, crypto. I always say crypto, quote unquote, right? The the um, Because then people are going to comment like, no, Bitcoin is also a cryptocurrency. I mean, crypto as the industry, crypto, yeah. You know, those are all attempts by startups to, you know, create a, an ecosystem that's fueled by a token. Um and that token should have value because there's value in the ecosystem, right? But people are trading the tokens to speculate on, you know, other people trading the tokens. Basically, like it's a, it's kind of like VC game on steroids. It's, 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 it's wild. But the question I wanted to ask you, how, like, what was the thing that made you realize that you should, well, spend six months studying, uh, this topic? Like, can you remember what that was when? when you saw that light, basically, or had that epiphany of like, okay, this is a totally different thing. Yeah, I, I think the the absolute nail in the coffin, no turning back moment was realizing that you can't stop this thing, right? There's all these small steps along the way. Okay, you, you yeah. understand digital scarcity. 
okay, you understand um, what solving the Byzantine general's problem means in real life. You, you kind of understand all these things. But then I say, okay, well, if it is fixed digital units online, a fixed supply monetary asset, and it's out of the reach of governments and no one can stop you, why doesn't the government just shut it down? Right. And I think that's the, that, I think that's the last point for many people. And I yeah. think a lot of people haven't come to that conclusion, but it's the last me, that, question you what, can ask, right? Like the last uh, yeah. objection you can throw up. Right. Yeah. Yep. And a totally reasonable objection, mm -hmm. especially 2019 or earlier. It's a very real concern. Right. Um, I think now we're starting to see it integrated with the state and the, the game theory says you should just buy it instead of attack it. Yeah. And we, we can think that that's what people will do in the future. And that's what I assumed would happen. Now we're actually yeah. watching we're seeing that it. occur. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's probably what did it for me. But I think just to go one, one notch deeper, I think since then, what I've really come to is the fact that you can't change it. That's actually the, the primary value here. Mm -hmm. People think it's 21 million hard cap. That's the most important thing. Absolutely not. Um, the history of money is simply us co-opting the money for political reasons, yes. changing the rules for short-term needs, and then we erode trust in the currency and it breaks. And that's happened uh, as many times as we can possibly count. Mm -hmm. And so my sincere belief is that the fact that it's really hard to change is why we have something special here. That's what we need to preserve more than anything else. And if we do that, that also means we get 21 million because that would be changing a core function. So I think 21 million is downstream of this like rough consensus, hard to change thing. Yeah. And to me, that's what provides a potential future money that may last 500 years instead of 50 years yeah. uh, as, as many other monetary systems do. I think it's a very great point. While you are sharing, I'm thinking of basically Bitcoin is like Venn di diagram within a Venn diagram, <laughs> within a Venn diagram, right? In a bigger Venn diagram, basically. But I think the point that you're making, um, right? Like you can understand Bitcoin from, you know, a technological perspective. Like there, there is enough information to learn how Bitcoin actually work. But I think to really get it, you have to put it, I don't know, in a certain I want to say context or expectation or scenario kind of right to eventually realize these two things, right? It cannot be stopped. And that is because, you know, decentralization every 10 minutes, we verify on all, all these things, but it cannot be changed is not even a, a technological thing. It's more a psychological thing, right? And it's this, this game theory thing that that because it cannot be stopped more people get on the train you know and basically the train is driving and the tracks are being built in front of it so that's kind of how i see it right and the entire value the out the output of bitcoin the value that it puts out is this consistency is the promise of this train is going to run for 500 years that's why you should get on this train and then the arguments that come along right for people that are you know, skeptical about Bitcoin or however you want to call it, they they throw up these these little arguments. But once you realize that the train will keep running, they they are they are futile in a sense, right? And I think what you said, you know, is the government going to stop it because there, everyone is going to shut down the internet, right? I think it's a really interesting psychological um, experiment to do with yourself if you're skeptical of Bitcoin. If you end up with this question, think about if not even about Bitcoin, but what would make all the governments in the world turn off the internet at the same time? And that would be something that is extremely dangerous to, <laughs> to them, right? So your argument is kind of like verifying the value of uh, a Bitcoin, right? And just because you cannot critique it with your smaller arguments, you end up with this yeah, hyperbole of an argument, right? The internet is going to be shut off. I, I like that one. When people end up there, I say this, right? I say like, okay, but this is your last one, right? And my answer is going to be here. The game theory shows that not everyone agrees in this world for thousands of years, right? So how are all these governments together going to turn off the internet while there are, by the way, already satellites, you know, 
with nodes and miners and, and, and all these things. So this is not going to happen. The one after that that I get a lot is what if uh, Russia throws a nuclear bomb, <laughs> right? You know, and, th- and then I just say, well, are you going to call your stockbroker and be like, I want to cash out my, uh, you know, my Tesla stock because uh, a nuclear bomb just dropped, right? It's just uh, the argument is so hyperbolic that it's just invalid uh, at that point. Totally. I think it exposes how poor poor thinkers and reasoners humans actually are. We think we're logical. We think we make good decisions. But the reality is that's probably most people just coming up with a conclusion. I don't like this thing for whatever reason. It's new. It's weird. I feel like I got in late. I don't understand it. That's the actual truth. And then yeah. they come up with reasons to justify their existing position rather than think through it. Yeah. Right. And so I think the biggest barrier for people to understand Bitcoin is um, it's really like something around ego. It's some ability to um, see Bitcoin with fresh eyes and not bring all your existing baggage onto it. So it's some version of that. And it's some version of uh, and maybe a prerequisite, prerequisite for that is having a low desire for social uh, reinforcement. Meaning mm-hmm. that we're, we're social creatures and it's really hard to go against the norms. And so I think early Bitcoin people have a really, really easy time doing weird shit that normal people find, uh, strange. Mm-hmm. Whereas the average person, they, they don't change their mind on anything until consensus is already flipped. Right. And so you're rewarded yeah. for being on the edge of culture, yes. on the vanguard of new and weird things. And so that plus a little ego dissolution. Um, those, those two seems, uh, seem yeah. to be the things that predict early adopters. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I, I, I do, I do think it has to, it, I don't know if it's 50, 50, it's probably 50, 50, because it has to do with your character, right? Like uh, how, how you introduced yourself and what I heard from that, what I gave back to you is like, from my perspective, you are someone who's curious about technology and trying out new things. So that already is kind of a prerequisite to spend more time in learning about Bitcoin, not even building your conviction, but just learning about what, what is this thing, right? Uh, and, and then we also have people that, you know, look at a, in, in Euro, a, a blue banknote and an orange banknote and orange one, you know, uh, is valued more because the number is different and, and, and they just blindly think that's normal, right? So there's a huge spectrum of people and, and I think also a huge spectrum in curiosity. But that, that ego part, right, is interesting because once you, can park your ego and go into this and realize, okay, this kind of fights against everything that I was taught, everything I think is true, or it shows me that I have no clue about why the you know orange bill is more valuable than the blue bill. Like I never thought about it, right? Once you let that in, then it becomes kind of like this. I don't want to say game, but it's uh, it's a, it's this personal exercise right and it draws you in this curiosity deeper and deeper and deeper until i don't know if you can remember one when you really flipped in your conviction i i cannot retrace it anymore it's just like a slow you know all these little touch points and then at one point it's just like okay i need to focus on uh yeah on this thing basically Yeah, I don't think I remember the exact moment. I think it was progressive, progressive mm-hmm. steps along the way, and then before you know it, it's too late. Um, yeah. I was also, I was also bored of the previous life, so I was looking for something new, and so I was very susceptible to a a big one hundred and eighty decision career change. Yeah, fun. Uh, that being said, I'm I'm always susceptible to that. To your previous point, um, constantly learning about weird things and. That's just how I'm built. So sometimes that gets me in trouble. I'm spread too thin, learning all these weird things. Other times it it provides gifts and the fact that you're early to things. And as long as you follow your nose, um, you can be rewarded for that, right? 100%. I'm just, I have flashback to 12 year old me trying the tennis ball ball bomb from the anarchist cookbook, actually. I don't know why. That's That's the thought that came in when I was like younger. I was just always on the internet. We ended up with the anarchist cookbook and we tried the tennis ball bomb. You make it with matches anyway. But, you know, it's this, right? Like, uh, and, and I was running around with my friend. I remember there was like other boys that were like, what are you doing? We were like, no, we're building a bomb. <laughs> you know, we entered forest. <laughs> anyway, but I think, you know, it's, it, you also have to be a bit lucky with your character because 
And, and I think you see that too. There's lots of very, very smart individuals, Nobel Prize winning individuals that are very anti-Bitcoin, but all their arguments, their arguments never revolve around actual substance. Like from my perception, it's very emotional, which also is a sign that they don't know a lot about the content, right? Um, but I want to talk about the other side. Like what, what is your explanation for the effect that Bitcoin has on people that understand it and build their conviction through study, you know, uh, they get motivated even more to pursuing more knowledge, helping, you know, getting a drive to help create a change in the world, et cetera. What, uh, what is your explanation for that? Yeah. Like what, why do people interact with this? digital money, software, free project, whatever you want to call this thing, and then radically change their life. That's kind of Well, you went from entrepreneur to employee for five years. I'm, you know, spending uh, a lot of time on this podcast. There's, there's people building all these different things, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, so my, my opinion here is that the average young person today feels somewhat hopeless in the world. And I would put myself in this category pre Bitcoin for sure. I was making phone calls for presidential campaigns, trying to change the world through the existing systems, getting frustrated with what I was seeing, feeling a bit of hopelessness, like nothing I do can actually change the world for the better. So that was kind of the conditions I was in when I, when I stumbled into Bitcoin. And I think that's common across many young people. Then you find Bitcoin and you go, huh, okay, I don't trust the institutions. Here's an antidote to that. What if we can rebuild something more like a new layer of the internet that's a public good for everyone, but actually removes the need to trust these folks that we don't trust? And so I think there's like the, the logical argument mm -hmm. there that says, hey, this this uh, you can essentially vote harder or you can go build some shit that makes the world that you want to see yeah. uh, happen, yeah. right? In a, in a Bucky Fuller kind of way. And then, okay, that's the intellectual argument. Then the other side of the equation is you start buying Bitcoin and that all of a sudden you go, whoa, savings is really cool now because if I store some Satoshis away and I wait a few years, my wealth goes up a lot. And in that type of environment, you're, you're instructed by Bitcoin to save more and think longer term. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually the, the deep shift that occurs is we just reorient our life to thinking more about the future. It's the same reason why people are healthier. It's the same reason why Bitcoiners seem to uh, are more pro natalists and having families, um, less flashy cars, uh, more value, like sell your chairs. All, all these memes and ideas are coming out of the same idea, which is simply think long term. And so it's a bit of this is where you put your political energy to change the world and a little bit of if you save your Bitcoin long term, you get more money and that makes you feel more confident, more free, more secure in the present moment, which then all the other downstream things start to matter like health and family. Um, and I think there's another element here where we become crazy evangelists in the first few years because we genuinely believe that we just discovered a secret to the universe. Once you realize that infinity over 21 million or no one can stop this thing or whatever <laughs> version of that that you internalize, yeah. you want to go tell all your friends and family because you genuinely feel like you figured out a secret. Yes. And I, of course that doesn't work. We come across like crazy evangelist cult members and humans are really good at being like, you're a little crazy there, dude. Uh, and so we get shut down. How do you, handle, how do you handle that? Uh, yeah. Because this, I, uh, I, I, I love using the word altru, uh, you know, it, it makes you altruistic. Like I, I have the exact same feeling, right? Like everyone I love should figure this out, but I cannot, you know, program it into their head. So That's I'm right. very annoying, right? A lot of, lot of conversations eventually end up, you know, about the money topic, the Bitcoin topic, etc. I have some people now that actually, when we meet, when we like, when we meet another couple, for example, at one point they start now talking about Bitcoin. So I have some questions about Bitcoin, right? And then my girlfriend always laughs, like I knew this moment would come, right? But um, some people reply like, yeah, you're not altruistic. You're trying to pump your bags because you have Bitcoin and blah, blah, blah. Like all the, this is also a test, 
right? Because when someone says that to you, you're like, yeah, am I actually doing that? Am I falling for something? Like, what is this, right? Like it challenges your conviction because you take that other per- person serious as well, or you love them, right? That's why, that's why you take them serious. So I, I, I love how Bitcoin is also this psychological test of which the title kind of is, can you still trust yourself or something like that, right? Because you did all the work. I think what gives you the drive to actually tell that to other people is because you trust yourself. You trust the conclusion that you ended up with. I think in my uh, case, I think Twitter and and, uh, podcasts and other videos and just hearing other people end up at the same conclusion as myself really helps me to kind of reflect on myself to realize, you know, I'm not crazy. You know, I, this big idea that I ended up with this big conclusion is shared with all these different people all around the world from all ages, all backgrounds, all races, religions, all these, all these things. Right. And it's just kind of disappointing sometimes when you try to convince the people that you love, but I now realize, you know, this is not about me, this is about them. And I was there also right like it's just it's just one big test in that sense yeah i think that the phrase when the student is ready the teacher appears comes yes. to mind here yes. so yeah you, you can't c- lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink right same, same exact uh thing there and i think that's absolutely true and so how do i approach that i think was one of your early questions mm. right now i just genuinely don't bring it up anymore um yeah. I already spammed all my close friends. They all own Bitcoin now, which was a rocky, it wasn't an easy path. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now it's more like, it's clear that I'm interested in this thing and I'll drop little breadcrumbs here and there. And it's more like, if you want to have a conversation, you know where to find me. Yeah, Um, I think that's the right approach. And to your other point about um, noticing other people that you respect came to the same conclusion as you, I think that's very important with this Bitcoin thing because Bitcoin is full of very smart people that you would share a kinship with. And I think that made me want to go way, way, way deeper, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, We can be intellectually into this idea and be like, I'm convicted on this as an investment thesis, but that wouldn't make me want to work in the industry, wouldn't make me want to write essays and spend, I, I run a meetup for five years. I spend so much time dedicated to Bitcoin that I'm not paid for in any way. And there's no way I would do all that kind of stuff if I didn't feel like there was a a mission here that Mm. we're all a part of and something larger than our, than ourselves. Right. And I think that I, I would like to amend my previous answer. I think that's the secret here. Humans are best when we're working on something larger than ourselves. If we're just in our own narrow, selfish way, um, it just doesn't, nothing really matters. And so you can find that through raising a family. You can find that through a political mission or some sort of large mission that you think is, is good for the world like Bitcoin. And so as soon as you find that kind of thing, it's really easy to donate your time and talents to it. And then you find other people on the same mission. It, it just reinforces your beliefs. Yeah. Um, and I think convincing your friends to buy Bitcoin for sure, that's not going to move the price unless you know a bunch of billionaires who <laughs> exactly. move volume, yeah. right? I, yeah. I don't. So yeah. my friends buying a, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter for the price, mm. but it does matter for reinforcing my own beliefs to your previous point. We are social creatures. If I can't convince any of the people around me to buy Bitcoin, maybe I'll question this thesis a little bit. Uh, or maybe I'll have to go to Twitter or I'll have to go to meetups to try and find other people who came to the same conclusion because mm. I'm subconsciously worried about my own decision. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Yeah. I, I just this is an entire rabbit hole by itself. I think we sh- we should talk to some kind of like Jungian psychiatrist or something. I don't know. We should we should, we can explore this deeper. Uh, well, uh, about exploring, I wanted to ask you. So this experience with psychedelics, how has that helped you in understanding Bitcoin? And I want to say the 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 the, the grandness of what this could be, because I think to understand that you have to zoom out outside of your individual. Uh, self, right? Definitely. I think in general, psychedelics deprogram people and they give you a chance to observe things without all your cultural programming. So separate from Bitcoin, um, properly used with a healthy mind, healthy body, 
Um, it's very common for people to say, hey, I can think more creatively. I can problem solve a little bit differently. I can, I see my own bullshit, the areas I'm blocking myself. I see where society is steering me. And it just sort of gives you a clearer lens to evaluate the world. Um, not always true for everyone all the time. Caveat, caveat, right? Do your own research, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I think that's the general value that you can, uh, you can achieve through these tools. In regards to Bitcoin, I would say, Bitcoin is, no matter what you bring to this thing, um, it can appear a little bit differently. I think Gigi called it a prism, right? And mm -hmm. so in my mind, understanding it from multiple angles and how it fits in context is probably the biggest value with Bitcoin. And yeah. so it was 20, it was what, January 2018. I was maybe six months into this journey. I, um, went on a hike, took some LSD and I was like so far down the rabbit hole. The topic just of course came up. It's all I thought about. Yeah. And I just remember having like, a like I could physically see what a decentralized network looked like and I could see how humans would interact with it, how it, it serves as like a layer in society and how it's really a bunch of individuals that come together that create this like digital super organism, essentially. Mm. It's not software, it's not computers, it's not people. It's this weird hybrid mix of our thoughts, our ideas, the software, the machines, the network, um, the tweets, right? It, it is kind of a combination of all this stuff. Yeah. And if you only look at one of those layers, the, the software or the monetary economic piece or whatever, you totally miss it. And so like the, we, we were kind of riffing on the Nobel Prize, let's say economists who miss it. Well, they're trying to evaluate it based on a narrow definition of what mon monetary uh, technologies are. Well, it can't yeah. be money because money is defined as blank. Yeah. Right. Or the We're technologists who think it's too slow. Right. That's the same. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's a concert. It is a bunch of different things put together, including human nature. And you have to intuitively understand how humans will approach this thing and why we will innately value it and why the humans won't want to change 21 million in the future because all the holders get hurt in the process. Right. Yeah. And so it rewards complex thinkers. It rewards people who seek patterns. And I think both of those things are achieved through psychedelics. I also think there's a high overlap in the early Bitcoin people and crypto people, a high correlation between using psychedelics and finding this thing. Um, maybe because of like sovereignty of mind and sovereignty of money, right? There's a bunch of like surface layer uh, mm -hmm. overlaps there. But in my opinion, it, it's just a correlation of people who are on the fringe, who explore, who think things through. Uh, I think that's honestly the, the highest overlap. Um, yeah. <laughs> did you, did you know, I, I, I love, I love that description. And then I think like, apparently I am that too. But if you would have asked me when I was 25 or 30, maybe I, I, I could not have imagined uh, being being at that place, right? That's also why I just said like it's hard for me to retrace those steps. Like I have experience with psychedelics as well. Like I love the, the zooming out part, just the realizing the the fact that you're an infinite, you know, a tiny speck in an infinite universe and time and space and all these things, right? And but but drawing that back to this individual earthly. Um, experience which is very tiny compared to what you just described as you know this uh this world where all these things work together right or the system or however you want to call it i think that is the hardest part kind of like then translating okay if i then contribute to this thing what is my which cog am i in in in, in which part of the machine or or something like that right but then I think there's a lot of these mental models or kind of like these principles of Bitcoin that you can think about. For example, you said like uh, in the future, we wouldn't want to change it, right? Um, because nobody would benefit from it. But that is because everyone who uses it benefits from it, right? So you kind of like go down these steps of kind of like the principles or the 
um, how do you say, like the implications or consequences of 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 Bitcoin. And then you can reason like all the in in all these uh, different um, ways, right? I, I don't know. I, I hope that makes sense. But when you said like this big system, I think about the word manifestation. Like I see Bitcoin as like an ultimate manifestation effort, like a, like this this ball of energy where all all these different types of people do all these different types of things, right? From coding to writing to talking to you know whatever. And eventually we are creating this thing together to end up in a place where we can create more things together, right? Like it it goes up another level because if we end up in a place where we have hyper Bitcoinization and we follow the ideas of what would what would happen at that time, right? Everyone in the world would be empowered to build stuff again and not be a consumer uh, anymore. But to get to that starting point, we now have to build together, right? So it's kind of like all the, the again, these little steps up, like little steps of manifestation or some, something like that. Yeah, I like that. And it, it kind of brings me to the fact that Bitcoin is full of paradox, mm. right? It, it's, it's, yeah, it's capitalist and it's also in a weird way, communist, right? It's the most <laughs> individualist thing, ima- thing imaginable, uh, private keys, no one knows who I am, move my own money, no one can stop me. Also, we all have to work together to make this thing work. Exactly. Right. However, the, the genius is that Satoshi created a set, a set of incentives that if unleashed on humans would, does, would result in the outcomes that he was going for. Right. So the bet, the best part about Bitcoin are, are things that emerged out of humans interacting with software. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, like the fact that it won't change is not in the code. Anyone can change the code at any time. Yeah. Paradoxically, but no one will, is going to change the core version of the system unless everyone wants to. Right. It, yeah. It's a beautiful thing, honestly. And I think that's, that's where people underestimate it. And I think, honestly, I think that's where the crypto bros go super duper wrong is they're like system performance speed. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are superficial features that Bitcoin doesn't even compete on. And they're, they're like arguing no, not from an point. area that doesn't right. matter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's that, that, that is again, uh, oh my, like I referenced Jeff Booth so much, but this is the paradigm shift. Like you, you are in one paradigm and you take things from that, that help you to see this new paradigm, but you cannot measure the new paradigm or or benchmark the new paradigm with this old thing, right? This old construct, and that is also, uh, yeah, I tweet about this a lot. Like, I, I, I am, you know, from tech startup world. I, 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 I love technology, internet, all these things. I'm just baffled that the most well known technologists, a lot of them, they are not paying any attention to Bitcoin. They're they're messing around with Solana because it's faster or whatever. Like, it, it. It shows this, um, I don't want to pet myself or you on the back too much, but this, yeah, just the intellectual curiosity. You can be curious about a technology, but the technology has to do something in the world, right? Like you can make something faster, quicker, shinier, you know, but if you, um, if there's no like base layer value or reason for existence, a reason for adoption, then it will fail, right? And for me, that's pretty logical uh, reasoning, but these technologists are playing this other money game, right? Like, let's say the VC money game, and, and there, yeah, you, you, you park a lot of these things, right? Because you're just playing a different, different type of, of game. And I think if you think about paradigms, right? Like VC game, Silicon Valley VC game versus you know, free open source software is also uh, a, a paradigm in that sense. Definitely. And I, yeah, I think, I think Silicon Valley and crypto folks approach it tech first. Yeah. I think the Austrian Bitcoin investment thesis guys think about it as like a synthetic digital commodity exactly. or something like that. Yeah. And I think that totally makes sense superficially why they land in certain areas. And then those same investor bros would call the crypto stuff like a VC bet or a Facebook platform 
on decentralized rails or whatever. Yeah. And that's a that's an okay starting point, right? You're like ankle deep in the water. Mm-hmm. Um, but where I think Bitcoin is properly understood is like a new type of institution, um, similar as the internet, similar as SMTP. Uh, it's just a new layer that that the humans get to use, and it has new attributes that we haven't had before. And yeah, it the the, the money side just makes the adoption incentivized, right? So I, there's like two stages to Bitcoin. It's us figuring out what we just created. And that's the rapid monetization phase. We're still mm-hmm. in that. It's get yeah. rich quick, whatever. Then at some sort of an equilibrium, okay, now we know how much value does a society want to store in a, in a protocol like this? Let's say a hundred trillion. Okay, now we have a thing. Uh, but what does that mean after that? It's mm-hmm. done monetizing. It's done growing. If it's no longer a sexy investment, if it's no longer counterculture, if it's no longer fuck the state, uh, sorry for cursing so much, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is this thing at equilibrium and what does it yeah. mean for society at equilibrium? And to me, it does become a social institution. That's why you don't want it to change. Uh, small change is fine. Existential change is fine, but political changes, temporary mm-hmm. changes, short-term changes, that's where, that's where we need to get rid of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Like the 21 million was an arbitrary number, right? It's not about 21 million, 18 million, 20 million. It's more about that won't change, period. Right? Like that, it's, it, it's not about the 21 million. It's about keeping the promise that it won't change and, and forcing exactly. that into perpetuity, basically, right? That, that, that is more the point than the number of, uh, units that, uh, that, that are created. Yeah. But so. If we are on this road, right, this uh, uh, proliferation of Bitcoin and we end up, at, let's say, at the hundred trillion, I kind of view it as it will act as a mirror for the other paradigm that a lot of people will still be in, right? Not everyone will have adopted Bitcoin by then. It's not the world reserve currency, all these things. Um, previously, I thought that we actually should go all the way there to see the effects of what, you know, the hardest money to ever exist could um, uh, could give us. But now I kind of see it, let's, let's uh, stick with the 100 trillion uh, mark, right? If we get to that point and it acts as a mirror for this other fiat system, this predatory money system, how do you think the concept of trust will change in money institutions because bitcoin will also be there in a such a significant way that it will definitely not die anymore yeah good question um trust is really really interesting so let me try and break some of this down um first of all trust is a good thing high trust is a is a great thing Um, if you can trust the people around you, it makes all the interactions easier. It makes social cohesion easier. It makes markets easier, blah, blah, blah. And when I think about trust, I think about Nick Zabo and his phrase on social scalability, which is, uh, essentially, um, how do humans cooperate flexibly over in large numbers? Uh, you could also call that sort of like scaling trust, right? We started in small groups of 100, 150 people, mostly kin in like a hunter gatherer type environment. You can more or less trust everyone in that group because you have some sort of social relation. They're either related to you literally with genetics or an arm's reach away. Uh, but we had a really hard time breaking above that number, right? Because the humans can't keep track of that many relationships. So how do we expand trust beyond the hunter gatherers? Well, we can create a religion. Okay, I see you on the on the 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 trail between yeah. village to village, and I see you're wearing the same symbol on your shirt. So I assume we have shared values, so we can tr- trust each other more than if you didn't have the same symbol on your shirt, right? Then you can you can come up with all these other different technologies, social technologies that allow us to expand our ability to cooperate. Essentially, expanding trust. That could be the English language. That could be rule of law, that could be um, court systems, that could be all different things. Uh, money would be one, right? I don't need, money is interesting because I don't have to trust you in any way if I know your money is good. Uh, you give me the gold coin, here's the chicken, 
right? Um, and I think where Bitcoin comes in is Bitcoin enables a new scaled up version of cooperation and trust because even with money, you give me the gold coin and I'll take the chicken. Gold is is easy to counterfeit. How do I know it's not gold wrapped around nickel? How do I know it's not something else? And so historically, the king would stamp his face on a gold coin and say, this is the gold coin. I know how much gold's in there. If you trust the king, you can trust the coin. And what, what did Satoshi say? Well, the root problem with conventional currency is all the trust required to make it work. Yeah. Central banks must be uh, trusted not to debase the currency. Of course, history is full of breaches of that trust, right? So that sort of gets us to 2007, let's say pre, pre Bitcoin. We, we always had to trust the issuer of the currency, whether it's central banks or a king or whatever. Um, what Bitcoin does is says, Hey, we're going to pay this enormous cost of decentralization. And we're going to duplicate the ledger on all these machines. We're going to let anyone verify the ledger, anyone verify the transaction. These are really costly design decisions when you first make this thing. So we pay that cost of decentralization up front. And what does that do? That makes trusting the system go way down. So now we just scaled trust to essentially infinity uh, from at least from a human perspective, we can call it infinity. So trust is super cheap now because you can have commodity hardware to verify the ledger. And what does that do? That makes the entire world be able to join a monetary network, uh, which is a social technology that does not require trusting the issuer. And okay, now all of a sudden you bring everyone online, anyone can participate, no one yeah. can stop you. The network doesn't even know who you are or where you're from, what your beliefs are, what your religion is. Um, it's not knowable from Bitcoin's perspective. And so that all of a sudden shatters this glass ceiling of social scalability that we've been stuck at for so long. And what does that mean? It means Anyone anywhere in the world can participate globally in the economy. What does that mean? Well, if someone has a good idea that changes the world, they now have a good chance of bringing that to market. And it doesn't take many good ideas to change the world, right? If you go back and say, what if we didn't have Beethoven or Mozart? What happens if we didn't have uh, Nikola Tesla? What happens if we didn't have insert person? The world would suffer tremendously. Right. So we just brought everyone online. That's going to spill over into more people. And I think looking ahead, what that means is we can now trust each other and increase global trade in a way that that's never happened before. Um, and I honestly think of this like an extended phenotype uh, from biology, which is like we have this new technology outside of our physical body. Um, right? Extended phenotype away from our physical specimen that allows society to scale socially in a way that's totally unique. Yeah. Um, in the same way that a beaver creates a beaver dam, the beaver dam changes the world. Um, I kind of feel the same about this Bitcoin thing. And we can rally around this. It provides stability in the world. It reduces, um, it reduces the game where political elites try to capture the money because mm -hmm. that's such a high point of leverage. Uh, whatever Rothschild from a long time ago said, I don't care who makes the laws if I control the money, mm -hmm. right? And so that that essentially removes that whole power game around trying to capture the money. And then what happens? People no longer have an incentive to capture the money. So maybe that energy is spent in a more productive way. Yes. Uh, it, it totally is a base layer foundational uh, technology in our social stack. And yeah. I, I think most people are nowhere near thinking about that kind of stuff, but that's okay. They don't have to think about it. It will happen gradually over time. Yeah. I think that's also, uh, oh, so many faults. That is also what we should keep in mind that, uh, we are talking about it like this, but we should not expect for everyone to understand this, which again, is this part of this test to, play this long game to have this low time preference, right? Also one of the things I think that Bitcoin uh, teaches us. Yeah, to talk about the mining, I just actually got the, the BitX uh, Supra. Um, th th this is, yeah, you, you said it, right? You can participate in this. You can verify the money that you use. You do not, you do not have to trust other people and therefore you can trust everyone, basically. 
right? Because you can verify it for yourself, you can trust all these other people and the other way around, right? It's, it's, it's a mutually beneficial game. It's not a zero sum game, which again, if you talk about paradigms is, is what we grew up in is the quote that you just shared, right? I don't care who's, who's in charge as long as I'm in charge of the, of the money that, that is, that is that. And ah, dude, this is so big. It's so big. The, the way you ended, I think that's the best social argument is once we are all in control and at the same time, nobody is in control. We can actually build again, right? Like think about, I, I love the idea. I don't know if it's on the Rhodos, like a Greek island. I don't know if you know the, I think it's Rhodos, like the, they had like a huge statue in the harbor that welcomed like people. I don't know if you Googled that. Um, stuff like that, like does it doesn't have a purpose. I don't know. Is it beautiful? Yes. Would it stay somewhere for like 2000 years? Yes. Are there people that worked on that and never saw the finished thing in their entire life? Yes. Right. Were they happy? Maybe, you know, like that, like just think in a, in a bigger way, but, um, the example you gave, right. Um, you do not need many, many things, many new discoveries or inventions to change the world. Do you think that this is also why some people are still skeptical that they cannot imagine or maybe fantasize about the fact that they could be living through this massive change in the in the in the world and then i, th I think that would be a nice leeway also into your fourth fourth turning um uh, perspectives but yeah the people that lived in the time that the uh, wheel was invented didn't think about oh now the wheel gets invented or something right like so may maybe it's logical but i think we have way more information nowadays so uh maybe it's also harder to recognize yeah i think yeah a couple of points i think what comes to mind here is is thinking about how we don't know that we're living through history because you have to see it in context you have to see it with more time has passed before you really know like yeah, the wheel came out and you're like, great, it seems pretty interesting, but society yeah. hasn't fully adopted it. We haven't seen the second, third, fourth order yeah. uh, changes as a result of that thing. But there were also and, probably people, sorry to interrupt, there were also probably people who were like, you know, commenting on the concept of it being round, right? Like same for gunpowder, same for the phone, same for like, it's always like that. Mm hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And to tie it to the fourth turning, I think what's interesting about that as a as an idea, as a concept um, related to this specifically is that according to that thesis, every 80 to 90 years, we find ourselves in this crisis period, um, usually some sort of a civil war, global war, war abroad, whatever. But the point is we totally redo our institutions. And maybe that's because the natural state of the world is that institutions decay over time, right? We create this cool new idea. We create an institution around it. It's going great. And then time goes by and it no longer serves us as much because society changes or humans corrupt things or whatever it is. And then we look around and we say our institutions aren't really holding society together anymore. And we don't trust our, our institutions. And that creates a, a social climate where uh, we start to rebel against the institutions and we want some sort of stability and we're willing to make a large sacrifice to achieve that. And back, back to the history thing is no one alive today was really, re essentially no one that was around during World War II was alive, is alive today. Mm. Uh, obviously there are some exceptions, but pretty much no. And so what happens well, we're, we're sort of walking ourselves blissfully into potentially more wars. And that's because no one around is, is, is wise enough to tell us not to do these things. And that sort, sort of seems like the human condition is that we don't yeah. actually learn from history. And it's no surprise that that cycle, according to the authors, is roughly the length of one human life. Um, and we see that same parable emerging out of, I think it's called the third generation s syndrome or something. Yeah. Essentially, if you have a bunch of money, you give it to your kids 
your kids watched you go through that sacrifice. So they understand the value. They understand the principles and why it matters. But you go another generation or two past that, they have no connection to the sacrifices made or the values that were required in order to achieve that level of wealth. And so they don't have any skin in the game. They squander it. Uh, I think it's a similar principle here. And humans are, are faulted like that. I also don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because what that means is it essentially refreshes the ideas, refreshes the cycle every time. And just like young people, their job is to push the boundaries and be idealistic and take no history, like history, fuck history. We're just going to like do whatever we feel like doing. And that type of energy in a system is actually really good. Even though it's yeah. almost always wrong, it does force the system to change and evolve. Um, and then the older, wiser, conservative side, or just like more wisdom would say, hey, those ideas are bad because you don't understand the context. And that tension is actually a beautiful thing. And it, yeah. it, it's very good. But it's healthy good. also, right? Like some, yes. some more conservative stuff is part of the conservative stuff because it works. Yes, but there's also exactly. a lot of other stuff that you know was uh, made up in, in the past generation, for example, right? So you don't have to take that at face value. You should, um, yeah, battle that in a sense. Yeah, and it forces us to reaffirm our ideas mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis, right? Because yeah. if you don't stress to stress anything it becomes fragile. If you don't lift weights, you become weak, right? It's the same exact idea. So we want that tension over and over and over again to make sure the system's robust yeah. in the same way that the Bitcoin system gets attacked constantly. And that's because there's a monetary prize. There's a honeypot at the end of the rainbow. If you can hack this thing, there's a lot of money to steal, right? And the bigger it's got, the bigger the honeypot. So the more incentive to attack it. And every time it gets attacked, it learns, it evolves, it gets stronger. Um, and that includes the narratives, that includes the software, that includes yeah. the attack surface. And there's no way to bail someone out. There's no intervention in Bitcoin if times are tough. And if we juxtapose that with the fiat system, anytime times are tough, oh my gosh, the economy went down a little bit. Hurry up and change the inflation rates. Hurry yeah. up and mail everyone a check. And in the short term, it feels nice. It's politically popular, but in the long term, you're just hiding risk. You're hollowing it out. You're, you're pushing, kicking the can down the road. You're suppressing volatility. And all that means is in the future, you're going to have a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger problem that will cause way more disruption to society than if you would have just yes. allowed that small forest fire to happen today. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that's, again, this psychological ego dimension, right? I, the, the example is perfect. Uh, and two weeks ago uh, or, or something like that, we had this big crash. There were PhDs on CNBC calling for uh, all these measures. And, you know, because the stock market cannot go down 8%, right? Like, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's so short-sighted. But that, for me, is also part of why this Bitcoin thing is so big. This battle is is really big. It's a, it's a social, it's ide ideological, it's a technological uh, battle, right? But it, it operates at this level that is f far above our, our, our individual, um, lives in, in, in that sense, right? It, it, it is in that sense, way more about our kids' lives or their kids' lives. If we, if we think about these, these generations, um, right. Yeah. But, Again, I think that takes a certain, um, yeah, the activity of zooming out from your from your individual life, right? And uh, yeah, create or have that ability to 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 look into the future. So yeah, so we see this this fourth turning. I think the thesis is we are living in in that part, the last twenty years of these uh, or, or these these eighty years. Um, I think the West is in essence a, a big subject uh, in, um, in, in this fourth turning. How do you see Bitcoin, does Bitcoin have a role in shaping the new America or the new West that might emerge after this period is over? 
Yeah, definitely. So at the end of the cycle, and by the way, there's a book on, if this is new to you, there's a book on the topic called The Fourth Turning came out in the 90s. They studied generational cycles. They they observed generations and then they created a, a cycle pattern theory around this. And essentially, humans... Uh, go through the 80, 80, 90 year cycle, but there's four stages in this cycle. And it's all based on the, the climate, the social climate and how we respond to our environment. Um, it takes a bit of time to digest it. So I'm going to skip over the basics and, and try and get to the question here. Um, but Neil essentially Howe, Neil Howe is the author, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. And at the end of the cycle, what happens is we are seeking order. Um, so that's maybe a shorthand version is the supply versus the demand of order. And so if we go back to World War II or right after World War II, we just got done fighting Great Depression. It was chaos. What happens? Humans want stability after that period of war. We reimagined the world. We, we created all this crazy change. And we're just sick of fighting. We're sick of change. We want stability. We want equality. We want it to be chill. <laughs> then we go through a period uh, the generation after World War II, where the baby boomers were born. They were born in this relative stable period. They grew up and they look around and they go, why is everything so stable and boring? Like, can we live yeah. a little bit? So when they come of age, they create a social change. They essentially rebel against that stability. They don't understand why, we, why we'd why we even want it in the first place. So Which we get is the 60s rights and movement. 70s, right? That's right. Sex, yeah. drugs, and rock and roll in the civil rights era. Um, and then the children of that generation, they grew up and their parents were individuals. They were the yuppies. They were the hippies, et cetera. So they parented their kids that way. They parented their kids as, and that's uh, us. essentially, right? yeah. yeah. Depending on how old you are, I think you and I are similar age. So yeah. yeah we, well, the we millennials, under- right? We are, the, that's the millennial generation. That's right. Yeah. Under parented. Oh, Gen, Gen X too. It, it spans mm-hmm. both Gen X and yeah. millennials. Um, but the Gen X kids were underparented. So they're wild individuals. Um, think like the kids from Terminator or the Goonies or things like that. Right. And then all of a sudden we look around and we go, the kids are nuts. Um, what are we doing? We can't trust these little monsters. And then the pendulum swings back again. And in the nineties, it was about over parenting your kids. Everyone's unique, a sticker on your car that says babies on board. Right. Um, again, the pendulum shit. Yep, exactly. So I'm trying to paint the picture that there's climates and there's moods and they change. And during the nineties, uh, back to supply and demand of order, um, essentially the demand for order and the supply for order are low. We're deregulating. Economics are still good. Um, the world, the institutions are starting to crumble, but nobody really cares. And then the fourth turning, the last part of the cycle, which we're in now, started around 08, is essentially the period where um, our institutions suck. They don't. We don't trust them, but we realize that we need them. That's that demand for order rising, rising, rising. And so how Bitcoin fits in here is um, historically the the seeking order comes from either uh, uh, flirting with communism, flirting with fascism, and being willing to go to total war to save yourself. Um, That type of energy comes in. We got to make a major change because society is going off the rails. And so what we need to resolve the fourth turning is a source of stability, a source of order. Usually that's post-war. We reset the pieces. Nobody wants to fight. We have new institutions. Um, I think Bitcoin plays that role, in, at least in some extent, as a new institution, because as we, we mentioned prior, no state is involved. This is a social technology. This is a public good, just like the Internet. And it allows us to individually save our wealth which helps us not want to fight as a country, as a state, um, as a business. We can start moving ourselves over to this new Bitcoin thing rather than um, crumble with the old system. So it's kind of a pressure release valve moving us Mm. over to a new system. And it also serves as an institution providing some stability and some order because in this particular fourth turning, we have a major debt problem. That was not two in the previous one, which was 1929 to 1945. And so in that situation, we could spend our way out of the problem with little consequence. 
Now, if we spend money like crazy, we're going to have incredible inflation. And so I think the Bitcoin side of this equation helps us with the debt problem. And it also helps us with the seeking order and stability problem from institutions. So doesn't mean we're going to be totally fine. Doesn't mean we're going to just transition smoothly over to a Bitcoin standard. That would be nice. But all previous fourth turnings, so the end of these cycles, have ended in total war. And all total wars have come during fourth turnings. Mm. So previous one was World War II. Before that, we had the Revolutionary War. Uh, before that, Civil War. Sorry, Civil War, then the Revolutionary War. And um, yeah, I hope we don't have to do that now, but I, I do feel the war drum beating. And if we follow the author's thesis sometime in the next, let's say, decade, we should be on to the end of the cycle and on to a new one. So I would expect in the next three to five years, we'll hit the the peak of this crisis. Um, something large enough to sufficiently mobilize the population to make great change. Doesn't have to be war, probably will be war. Um, if I had to bet, I see civil war-ish getting the, the chance of that in America growing rapidly right now. Uh, it's very scary to me. So I could see some sort of social unraveling situation in the U.S. that made America focus internally rather than like guarding the shipping lanes abroad. Mm-hmm. And if America focused internally, that's going to create a power vacuum abroad yeah. and any competitive nations will seize opportunities or will be likely to. Yeah. And so if I had to guess, it would be strife internally in America leading to global conflict afterwards. But again, low confidence in that prediction. Um, it could take any shape and I don't want to put any confidence around it, but gun to my head, that's how I would, that would be my mm-hmm. highest uh, percentage bet today. Yeah. I think uh, my last questions weave into this nicely. I will, I will combine them. So if, uh, well, people should check out the book, right? If they want to learn uh, more or read, read your article around it. But what do you think is the most important thing for people to study, to navigate uh, the fourth turning? It, is that Bitcoin or something else? Uh, and depending on your answer, if you could weave in like, what advice would you give to a millennial who wants to start exploring Bitcoin? Yeah, um, definitely can take that. So, okay, let's just assume for this answer that we're going through a period of social change. Um, I think it's pretty obvious for most people if you just honestly ask yourself, does it feel like we're going through a big one right now? And the answer is yes for most people. Mm. So assuming that's true, how would you want to position yourself individually to maximize the opportunity uh, or minimize the downside risk, however you want to look at it? And I think if I had to make it at one sentence, it would be make yourself anti-fragile, which means if things change, you benefit in that environment, not get worse. You actually get stronger through change. That would be the goal. How that can look, um, well, you can't go at it alone. That's not possible. So you want to maintain strong relationships, starting with your family, your parents, your cousins, your uncles, whatever. Maintain strong family relationships. If things get bad, that's who you can rely on the most. That also means form relationships online with like-minded people, whatever it is, great community. I would also say, don't get caught up in the internet. Don't get caught up in the latest thing. Don't allow yourself to live and take on the stresses of the entire world at all times. We are not designed to go on Twitter and like feel bad every day because something happened across the other side of the planet. So whenever possible, disconnect, touch grass, uh, focus locally. Mm. And especially if you're like an always online person who... Uh, is more volatile with the mood and kind of feeling down and doomerism, get rid of all that shit. Um, Go outside, build local community, realize the world's not as bad as the internet's telling you. Um, I would say invest in yourself. This is especially true for younger people. So what skills are valuable uh, now and in the future? Um, That might include, and I I would say don't specialize, be a generalist. So if you're a really good programmer, maybe you should learn to garden. If you're a farmer, maybe you should learn how to communicate with encrypted messaging tools, right? So try to create a more well-rounded version of yourself. Um, Regarding Bitcoin, I think obviously we're 
pretty into Bitcoin. So of no surprise, you should be saving as much Bitcoin as you can get your hands on, because no matter what this thing shakes out, um, Bitcoin looks like it will do well. If there's geopolitical uncertainty, Bitcoin is the money that is not attached to any country's fate. So Bitcoin's your hedge there. I think no matter how this shapes out, inflation is almost guaranteed. And in an inflationary environment, Bitcoin does well as well. So if it's global war or we just spend our way out of it and we have mega inflation, either way, Bitcoin's good. So get as much as you possibly can. Um, let's see, young people learning about Bitcoin, how to get into this thing. I would say, yeah, don't overcomplicate it. We, we talked about all this esoteric stuff, which is great. Yeah. But the reality is just form a thesis yourself, which is should I own it and how much should I own? Um, I would honestly start with the investment case and just make sure you're saving money every month and you're storing some of your savings in Bitcoin. Um, and then allow your curiosity to run wild. If you're interested in mining, go nuts on mining. If you're interested in the software side, do that. If you're interested in the economic side, do that. But yeah. you don't have to you don't have to understand it fully. No one does. Um, be comfortable making decisions with limited information. I would also say get to know real Bitcoiners, uh, Bitcoiners in real life, preferably. If not, go on Twitter, but go to conferences, go to meetups, whatever it is, like actually get to know these people and form real relationships. Don't yeah. let yourself get isolated. Um, which many Bitcoin people do, especially early on, because none of your friends, you're, you're first in your friend group. That's a common story. So go find real people. Um, it'll save your sanity and your spouse will appreciate you getting your Bitcoin energy out uh, in the cult rather than trying to spam all your friends and family with Bitcoin stuff. Uh, from experience, that's a, that's a good thing to approach. <laughs> Love that. That's great advice. Yeah, I love the generalist advice, actually. I always say practitioner, right? You have to, you can read about stuff, but you have to try it out as well to actually form your, not only your opinion about it, but also how you can actually apply it um, uh, in, in, in your own life. And um, yeah, just also, I think, again, that's a very, very good advice. The understanding why you should own it is probably step one. All the other stuff, a lot of stuff we talked about now comes after that, lo long after that, I think. Um, but perhaps that is, that what we talked about is also a touch point for someone where they're like, hmm, interesting that these guys ended up here, right? And it all started with moving into this, this other money system. But yeah, understanding why you should own it is one. Two is how much should you own uh, and, um, that's, that's basically it. I think, I think that's great advice. Okay. Last, um, last big question. And then my small question that I ask everyone. So you mentioned somewhere in the next 10 years, you know, this will come to an end. Uh, funny enough, that coincides with, um, in 2033, 99% of all Bitcoin will be mined. So that's roughly in the nine, 10 ish years. The, Last 1% will be mined in the 107 years after. So, um, and Michael Saylor talks about this a lot. This is the Bitcoin gold rush, right? If you want to have a significant um, amount, however much that is for you, you know, and uh, the more people realize that that is, that it is the case that they should own some. This, this will be the gold rush years for, for Bitcoin, but it coincides with this fourth turning ending. What are your thoughts on like global game theory now that we've entered this, this big shift that also coincides with this, um, Bitcoin gold rush? Yeah. I, I think we've, we've crossed some sort of imaginary line threshold, whatever in the last year. And what I mean by that is Bitcoin started out as an internet curiosity that it was sort of like weird libertarian dissident tech. And then it, then it was more viewed as like a tech platform, decentralized everything, computing 2.0. Um, then since like, let's say since COVID, it started to enter the more uh, geopolitical world. And I think that the biggest change that happened throughout all this time is that the world around Bitcoin changed. Bitcoin hasn't really changed. 
And so the narratives change, the people who own it change, the group of holders is getting larger and drawing from new areas. And so the surface area on the exterior of this thing has now started to penetrate the highest level of social organization. So this is the governments, this is the large corporations, the sovereign wealth funds, the doesn't matter who, it's penetrated every single group or social structure today. And so awareness is there. And I would say in the last few years, we're watching the geopolitical fabric start to fray. And we're starting to see the never ending bull market since we got off the gold standard uh, disappear. And so we're entering a new territory and right, the 60 portfolio is broken. Um, you can't just buy some real estate and hope for the best, right? Like all these adages have all these like assumptions that humans use to operate in the world are shattered. And what's happening now is people are slowly starting to realize that something has changed. And if you, if you accept the fact that something big has changed and you start looking for a solution, you end up finding Bitcoin in many cases, all right? Michael Saylor is a good example of that. Strongly dismissed it. Then he realized that his company was just lose destroying enterprise mm -hmm. value every year and he had to he had to figure out how to save it and el salvador in a similar situation i think u.s government it, it, at least right now in the u.s we're seeing the left and the right fighting over uh this voting block right and so essentially the bitcoin cohort has become big and powerful enough to be taken serious in politics right so i'm kind of just giving you all this context to say that we've entered the big leagues and this thing, uh, it doesn't go slower from here. It goes faster from here because as soon as one nation state adopts it or one serious player adopts it, the incentive, uh, to follow on, uh, is greater. And so I expect the gradually then suddenly meme to come true here. And I don't want to put any specific bats or predictions. I think they're all kind of silly, but I fully expect most countries, most corporations to own some Bitcoin by the end of the decade, um, and most humans as well. And it just makes sense. And it, it's really a function of how fast the world changes. That's how fast it will get adopted. The faster the world changes, the more Bitcoin gets adopted. If nothing happens, things are boring and steady, then fewer people will start to look around. And mm -hmm. so... Yeah, pain, change, catalyst, whatever you want to say, that that leads to increased Bitcoin adoption. Um, yep. I would add one more layer, which is that I think the meta right now is that we're entering a battle between like a techno AI communist super state versus like a emergent Bitcoin libertarian decentralized future. I kind of see that as the approach. And so dictators will choose the techno communist state and more mark free market based um lowercase l liberal societies will hopefully choose a more decentralized uh og america values bitcoin ish approach yeah. and so when countries go heavy-handed in the authoritarian approach what we see is a counter force in rising bitcoin uh to 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 fight that and so if you're looking for short-term predictions, look where there's the most authoritarianism, and I expect a large counterforce in all those situations. Um, and we'll, we'll get to see how Bitcoin plays in the harshest conditions. Hopefully it does well. Um, yeah, that, that's yeah. my take there. I'm optimistic yeah. also, Very nice. by the way. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, I like that. I, I, again, it's an example of the two paradigms, but at another fractal kind of blow, you know, blowing up, it's the pendulum swinging one side and then, you know, back, back to the other. But um, yeah, t two things to add to that. I, I said it in the last episode or the, or the one before, and I think you would enjoy that too. If you go to uh, Reddit, uh, the millennial subreddit, or go to any, well, I went to my country's uh, subreddit, or you go to the work subreddit, people know, people know. People know something is going on. There's so many posts of people who are like, you know, especially in the millennial subreddit, like, okay, I'm 32. I have this job. I did everything everyone ever told me. And this cannot be it, right, guys? Like, does anyone agree with me? And there's crazy discussions about, you know, all the uh, causes, of course, but people know, you know, stuff is going on. So 
you know, with your explanation, I would follow the, I, I don't think we are in a calm state. We are in a, in, in a restless state and, and people are aware of the shift that's happening, but they're not aware of where it comes from or how to solve it. Right. But I think, um, yeah, in due time, it would be my assumption because Bitcoin is so logical, so rational that you would eventually end up there, especially if there will be, uh, you know, governments that will force you to use stuff. Uh, I, I, I saw a tweet. I don't know if it's, it was old, but for example, the CBDC idea in Thailand was that the money was only valid for six months and you had to spend the money in six months within X amount of kilometers from your home. Like there are people who are going to swallow that. And there's people who are going to be like, Hmm, this is kind of weird, you know, and then their, their curiosity will be triggered in some way to, to dive into that more. Right. And with regards to game theory, yeah, I, I mean, I think the line of global game theory really starting uh, is very thin, right? If, if any serious country buys 10 billion in Bitcoin or puts 5% of their gold reserves, transforms that into Bitcoin, all the other countries have to follow if you like them or not, right? So yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I love, I love this part of, of the game theory. And that's why I love talking about it because I think the line is just very thin and someone is going to do it or is already doing it and not telling anyone, which I think would be the right, uh, strategy. But, uh, yeah, overall, the, the amazingly interesting, uh, topic there. Um, all right. The last question. And I ask everyone the same question, which is what is a core belief that you will never let go? Hmm. I got to go with the biology answer here. So I think in modernity, we've disconnected ourselves from our biology in a way where we just don't, okay, we evolved in the niche of planet earth. We evolved with the sun and the circadian rhythm and being outside and blah, blah, blah. So if you take all that as true, um, what are we missing out on in modernity? We're inside, fluorescent lights, we don't have community, we don't do exercise, we don't eat real food, blah, blah, blah. And then you look at modernity and you say, wait a minute, we are anxious, we're depressed, we're overweight, we're this and that, we have all these diseases of modernity, so something's not right. And so my core belief is that like biology is primary and if we don't respect our meat suit, we should expect to have a really bad time. And so that means like, go back to the fundamentals. Uh, we can't think our way out of this one. Our body has to be in, in harmony with nature. And this isn't some like crazy hippie thing. This is like, do the app. And also, by the way, I'm not a, uh, like go back to the land, only throw technology away. I'm a pro growth, uh, go to the stars version. Like that's my version of the future. But at the same time, that also means we cannot abandon our meat suit. So that means have a garden, go outside, take your shoes off, get sunshine, eat real food, spend time with community, with your family, etc. So it's a respect your biology while also uh, realizing that we're going to keep evolving with our technology and, and become a more technologically advanced society. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Uh, not a surprise, but I couldn't agree more. This is something that I talk about a lot. Like, I think it's fascinating that we talk about indigenous tribes and we say like, Oh, that's so cute, right? They practice medicine with plants, you know, <laughs> like that, 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 that we have that vibe, but that is where we come from and where we should go again. I think that's exactly what you're saying, right? So absolutely love that. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing. And yeah, man, thanks for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. I will link to your Twitter. Your writing so people can follow you and check out uh all your thoughts even deeper and uh yeah man enjoyed it thank you yeah thanks friend that was great i hope you enjoyed this episode if you did also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of bitcoin for millennials i appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode bye